Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second session of the Women's Rights and Climate Finance webinar series. My name is Bridget Burns from the Women's Environment and Development Organization. We're really pleased to have all of you with us this morning. Um, we're going to give it one more minute just to make sure others can join uh, and then we will get started. Okay, I think that we have everyone on that we need to to begin and we really want to make good use of our time for this second session. Um, just for an introduction to anyone who might be new to the GoToWebinar platform, um, at the start all of your mics are muted at the moment uh, and the presenters uh, have um, are unmuted so that we can share some of the slides with you. Our plan is to have a short and quick introduction for the first uh, 15 to 20 minutes to outline what we'll be going through for the day as well as um, give you a broad overview of gender in relation to global climate finance mechanisms. And then we'll pass over to our guest presenter, uh, Leanne Shalatek from the Heinrich Bull Foundation, and she will really go into a deep dive on the Green Climate Fund. In between all of those slides and presentations, if you have any questions, there is a question feature um, where you should be able to uh, ask a question. So feel free to do that. We'll be collecting them throughout the time. There's also two handouts that should be available to all of you. Uh, you'll see that uh, on your um, uh, slide sidebar as well. And these are the presentations that are going to be given today. So I'm just going to start, and again, um, if you have questions or if you need to, um, if you can't hear, if anything's wrong, please use that question bar um, to let us know. So the agenda for today, we'll be starting with a brief recap of our last webinar series, and then we'll jump into a quick overview of gender uh, and how it has been mainstreamed or considered in climate finance mechanisms. Following that, um, we have some of our colleagues who are attending the next upcoming Green Climate Fund board meeting um, who are our GCF monitors. And this is a part of the, the uh, Women Demanding Climate Justice program in which the webinars is one of the aspects of this as well as participation in the GCF board meetings. Then we will go into the deep dive with Liana Shalatek on Gender in the Green Climate Fund and hope to leave at least 30 minutes for an open discussion. So in our first series of this, um, first session of this webinar series, we looked at the overarching climate finance landscape. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure you can all see my uh, slide. Okay, hopefully you can. Sorry, so um, in this first, oh sorry, I just want to address some of the questions that someone's only able to see part of the slide. I'm going to ask uh, Liana, who's one of the presenters and unmuted, um, can you see my slides, Liana? Yes, um, now the full slide is, is available on the screen. Good morning, everybody. Okay. Good afternoon. Good morning, Liana. And if you, Liana, or any of the other organizers do see that there's something wrong with how the slides are, are being presented, please do jump in and let me know. Um, so hopefully this is okay now. Uh, in the first session of this webinar, we did an introduction to climate finance. We reviewed the feedback that we got from all of you on the topics that you're hoping we cover in this series. We introduced you to the Women Demand Climate Justice um, Partnership, which we do in both ends as a partner of GAGA both ends. Um, and through the funding of the Wallace Global Foundation, it is a project that has three strategies. One is knowledge sharing, which is, is really the aim, the goal of this webinar series. Policy advocacy, and so this will include developing strategy and supporting the actual participants of women to attend 
uh, women activists to attend the upcoming Green Climate Fund board meetings, um, and then access to climate finance. And this includes work uh, with women's funds, which is work that's being done by both ends and is part of work uh, as part of the GAGA Alliance. Um, the presentations that were given in the last session included an overview of climate finance uh, and experiences of engaging with the Green Climate Fund green climate fund from national and global levels and you can watch this presentation online you can find it at the link shared in this in this PowerPoint um, it's it's available on a YouTube channel and we are in the process of translating the presentations from this first session into French and Spanish and hopefully the video as well we also will be translating these PowerPoints from this session into French and Spanish, and we have been undergoing a process to find a platform, which we may have found um, for the next session so that there will actually be simultaneous translation available. Um, just an overview on future sessions. Uh, we ha have these dates, they are tentative, but firm. <laughs> um, we are hoping that, uh, and with any, unless anything changes, that the next one will be Friday, March 9th. And we are going to dive a little bit deeper into questions of accreditation and enhanced direct access, what that looks like, uh, where it's been successful, and what it might look like in terms of women and environmental funds getting accredited. Then we were, were hoping in April and May to move into strategies for organizing, as well as funding outside of major climate finance mechanisms for gender justice and climate justice. So I'm just going to kick us off uh, with a brief overview of what the history has been of really the technical policy work of mainstreaming gender considerations into climate finance mechanisms. And the climate funds discussed today, and this is a slide from our previous uh, workshop webinar, uh, are really what we look at as sort of the major public um, multilateral climate financing mechanisms, including the Global Environment Facility, the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund, and the Climate Investment Funds. So there, in addition to the funds themselves having very uh, clear histories and mandates for mainstreaming gender, there are also mandates under the UNFCCC, uh, the UN Climate Negotiations, the Climate Convention, that guide and frame some of what has been happening under the climate funds, noting that the only fund that had operational guidance from the beginning on gender was the Green Climate Fund, and that happened in 2011. And this is also from our previous webinar, that there's a series of activities under what you may have heard of as the Gender Action Plan coming out of COP23, which intends to take some of the lessons and learning from what the climate finance mechanisms have been doing in their own mandates and address how you can um, support and enhance gender responsive access to finance, for example, or and or the integration of gender budgeting into climate finance at national level. With the Global Environment Facility, just quickly looking at that, um, in 2011, and again, this fund has been around um, I believe the longest of all the climate funds, but uh, um, Liana can correct me if I'm wrong. And it's, it is a, an operating, it's a mechanism of the UNFCCC, but it is unlike other funds, not set up to be solely focused on uh, as a climate finance mechanism. It administers adaptation focus um, uh, LDCF fund, the least developed country fund, as well as a special climate change fund. It adopted a policy on gender mainstreaming, um, as well as a gender equality action plan in 2011. And then a new policy was adopted in, in 2017. And the Global Environment Facility has a gender specialist, which many, which many of the climate mechanisms, the climate finance mechanisms do. One thing that's really interesting to look at, if you want to dive deeper into, for example, the GEF the, and and why they have a new policy is that there was an independent evaluation in 2017 which set forth, rec set forth recommendations and so there's a really clear evaluation of what was working and what wasn't and how um, gender need to be needed to be better mainstreamed into the policy and into the projects and according to the jeff website um, the inclusion of gender in projects 
enables environmental management while sim simultaneously encouraging gender equality. And I put this in here because one thing that's interesting to note is in all sort of uh, climate finance, but also climate change policy decision making, you often see the first step of gender mainstreaming is looking at women as vulnerable groups, with the second step really trying to integrate gender as a means to more efficient climate policy or more effective implementation. And what you're seeing, I think, and Leanna can speak more to this, is a shift towards, at least in the policy frameworks, trying to frame it as um, important because uh, of from a human rights perspective and related to other human rights instruments. And this has been a shift that we've seen in the, poli the gender policies under these mechanisms to start recognizing the importance of it not just being a utility or for effectiveness, um, but for the, the goal of gender equality. Um, and the gender mainstreaming policy of the the Jeff, the new policy um, ensures that all new or it, it tries to ensure that all new projects established and funded must conduct a gender analysis and develop a gender responsive results based framework. Um, and again, this is reiterating what I've just said. The new policy translates into concrete policy rec requirements for their ambition to shift from a gender aware, do no harm approach to a do good gender responsive approach. And these are the three key things that the, the new policy aims to do in terms of providing greater clarity and, and formalization about the requirements for addressing gender equality in Jeff financed activities. They use the Jeff gender marker, which sets out four criteria to evaluate project success, success in mainstreaming gender, which includes having conducted a gender analysis, developed gender actions, included gender indicators, and really importantly, specified budget allocations for gender actions. And here we see that um, they, they rate this on the basis of either um, not meeting any of these criteria, meeting partially these criteria, meeting all of them. And by December 2016, 100% um, of these of UN environment projects had received a rating of one or above, with almost half being fully mainstreamed according to these gender markers. Um, just moving along quickly, because I want to make sure we have time for the allocated time I said we would. In the Adaptation Fund, um, gender analysis and integration has been happening unevenly since the beginning and early project proposals and policy efforts. But again, um, as we said before, most of these funds have had to retroactively integrate gender into their portfolios. Um, there was a lack of systemic approach to gender equality. And in 2006, the Adaptation Fund adopted a gender policy and action plan. And again, going back to that point, the policy and action plan strives to attain, gen attain gender equality as its goal. Um, and I added this line in here because um, it, the, it's part of the actual policy itself. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I hopefully you see that. Um, it expands the principle of gender equity and women's empowerment, which is process oriented and often subjectively contextualized to the legal mandate of gender equality as the goal that the fund strives to attain through this through its processes. So you see this a lot in the later policies that have been coming out. And I have some um, some resources at the bottom of these slides where you can find more information about the different funds and how their their history of integrating gender into the processes. And then finally, the climate investment funds, which are not a fund within the financial mechanism of the UNFCCC. They are outside of it, and they are the trustee of the climate investment funds is the World Bank. Um, the SIFs uh, had a, a resulted again from a review, and so these reviews are really useful in seeing where funds have had large gaps and challenges in, in integrating gender. Um, they adopted their first gender action plan in 2014 followed by a second phase of that gender action plan. Um, this resulted in the creation of a gender focal point at the climate investment funds. But still, under these action plans, because there was no policy-wide mandate at the beginning, gender integration was very uneven across the, the climate investment funds of four different funds. The largest um, is the Clean Technology Fund, 
or the CTF. Um, they also have uh, the PPCR, which is the pilot program for climate resilience and really focused on adaptation. And so you saw a lot more gender integration into the projects there than under the Clean Technology Fund. Um, but a new on January 29th, so just a few days ago, the CIF-wide gender policy was adopted. And the aim of this policy is to really address that coherence and unevenness and start to look at how gender can be formally integrated across all of the programs. And in the action plan, you can also find that the CIF has a number of knowledge products and guidance relation related to sustainable forest management, gender and renewable energy. So the secretariat within the CIF also, and in the action plan also recognizes the importance of making sure that this mainstreaming is happening across the different funds. So that's a really very quick overview of the different pieces. And we have people on the call who I know have different levels of engagement with these different funds and can speak to what that actually looks like and how it maybe is or isn't working when it comes to actual project implementation at a national level. Um, I did want to quickly, before passing over to Liana, to uh, give a deep presentation on, on the Green Climate Fund, um, to introduce you to our uh, three uh, GCF monitors. And again, this was a part of the overall program that um, we do in both ends are working on in terms of uh, enhancing advocacy and influence of women's rights advocates in the climate finance processes, one of which is actually supporting the participation of women from different regions to attend GCF board meetings, but more importantly, to support and foster um, regional networks or feedback channels, if you will, of trying to monitor and track the, the ongoing and very persistent um, new programs and projects being put through the, the GCF because it's a lot and I'm sure Leanna will speak to that more. So I don't know if any, I can't see, there's wonderfully a lot of people on the call. I'm just, I think that Marie Julia is on, so I'm going to unmute you, Marie Julia. Um, just to say hi, if you're able to. I think you said that you're um, that your connection was going to be bad. So if that is the case, that's fine. I'm just trying to see if anyone else was able to join. Um, I can't see at the moment. So what I'll do is. Um, I, I just have them up here, um, but the, the point is that they will be reaching out to different um, activists in the region who would like to think about and, and form together a plan or, or how they can work together to try to um, follow, support, and, and monitor what is happening at the GCF. Uh, and so when we come back to this at the end, if any of you are on the call, please raise your hands and let me know. Um, and we can we can share more information about what our hope to how we hope to move on with next steps in that process. So great. So with that, I'm going to move now to Leanna. And just give me a second to change PowerPoints. Okay, perfect. Full screen. Leanna, can you see this now? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, so I'm just going to pass over the keyboard and mouse to you. There you go. Great. Um, so I hope that, that it works. Um, so again, um, thanks so much for including me in the discussion. Um, um, I'm going to try and talk particularly about the Green Climate Fund and whether the Green Climate Fund as uh, the newest kid on the block in terms of multilateral climate funds and the largest public multilateral climate funds with 10.3 um, billion in pledges 
can actually really set new best practice for gender responsiveness. Um, where are we within the Green Climate Fund and what are some of the possibilities uh, for improvement? And maybe as a background, um, so that you know why I pertain to speak on the Green Climate Fund and think I know a little bit about the Green Climate Fund. Um, I do represent civil society on the Green Climate Fund board, um, civil society for developed countries, a so-called active observer. Uh, CSO Active Observer. Um, I also have been engaging in the process uh, first to develop uh, the Green Climate Fund governing instrument and then basically to operationalize the Green Climate Fund from the very beginning. So I had the um, doubtful pleasure of being a participant in all of the 18 GCF board meetings so far um, and again a part of my uh, continued engagement with the fund and advocacy work really focused on trying to ensure that the GCF really uh, can hit new crowns in terms of gender responsiveness and maybe does a couple of things um, better than other funds have um, in the past. And um, um, now I would like to continue on to the second slide, although um, I have to admit I'm not quite sure how to do that. I'm sorry. Uh, I think you can press just the arrow down. No, that doesn't work. Okay. Maybe you to... take it over and, and um, oh, there we go. I... So uh, just, just a really a quick introduction uh, on the Green Climate Fund, not spending too much time there. Um, it's very important, though, um, to understand that it is one of the centerpieces, if not the centerpiece of the UNFCCC long-term um, finance commitments, uh, both under the pre um, 2020 ambition and for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Um, it was um, uh, approved uh, at Cancun in COP16 with uh, following um, operational, um, uh, sorry, uh, with the following um, design process that led to the approval of the governing instrument, which is kind of the constitution of the Green Climate Center Fund at the COP17 in Durban. It is um, similar to the GEF, a so-called operating entity of the financial mechanism of the UNFCCC and fulfills the same role for um, uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, its secretariat sits in Songdo. Um, a board is uh, 24 members, 12 from developed, 12 from developing um, uh, countries with a dedicated board seat, uh, both for, uh, for LDCs and SITs. Um, board has met 18 times and some of the things uh, that, that are uh, interesting about it, it allows recipient countries direct access, but countries need to accredit national implementing entities first. And um, I saw that in some of the future webinars, you will hear a lot more about that. It also pertains to have a country driven approach uh, with a lot of importance put on national planning documents um, as the sources from which basically proposed projects for the Green Climate Funds are to come. It is indeed the first multilateral climate fund, which has um, a mandate for a gender sensitive approach from the outset. And um, uh, while it took a while to basically uh, get to the full operationalization point um, in the past couple of over the past couple of board meetings, it has been approving fast and furious. So we have now 54 projects and programs um, approved, worth together 2.6 billion. And we are hearing uh, tentatively that, for example, at the next board meeting, which is end of February in Songdo in South Korea, up to 25 um, project and pro uh, program proposals could be up for board consideration. The next slide. Sorry, I really don't know how to do it from here. <laughs> so, um, what what happened um, in terms or how, how is gender responsiveness integrated uh, in the Green Climate Fund? As um, as as I indicated, I think one of the really things that that made um, made it possible for the GCF to consider gender from the very outset is that we had um, as a as a new fund to be designed. We had a design process which allowed for the early engagement of gender experts and women advocates, including the Heinrich Böll Foundation, in the design process. And that means we participated as CSO observers in the technical committee meetings. We provided technical submission, which focused uh, then already on the integration of a gender perspective into all segments of the operational design and policy making, and 
taking a holistic approach to an understanding. And that then, um, to some extent, was taken up in the GCF governing instrument. And so that led um, to the approved governing instrument. Again, it was approved in Durban um, uh, uh, at the COP17 with some key references uh, to gender. Um, most importantly of those um, is the reference to a gender sensitive approach um, in the section of the governing instrument that deals with the objective and guiding principles of the fund. And that, in, in, in effect, enders, a, uh, anchors, um, in, in my perspective, uh, basically gender responsiveness or the mandate for gender responsiveness as a cross-cutting issue. Uh, you also have uh, the goals for gender balance uh, for board and secretariat stuff, uh, various uh, references to gender aspects or uh, in stakeholder engagement, um, and a an, uh, uh, deliberate um, um, a deliberate focus on women as a crucial group for input and participation in the design decision on an implementation of strategies and activities. The next slide. Sorry, Bridget, thank you. Um, so this is just um, shows you um, the, the uh, very important perspective passages in the objectives and guiding principles. While you can see that little coda of taking a gender sensitive approach, basically almost like an afterthought um, at para, uh, paragraph three of the governing instrument, that little textual reference allowed us uh, for advocacy and basically gave the mandate for pushing for an integration, a cross-cutting integration of gender in the board. So text really matters, text in policy documents really matters, why one of the ongoing strategy um, and advocacy positions um, for those of us who are engaged in the Green Climate Fund um, as observers is really to ensure that we get that uh, gender mandate or gender perspective integrated or referenced in, in all of the, uh, or in as many operational policies as we can. The next slide. Just really quickly, I'm not gonna delve into that. Um, that just shows you basically the areas in which um, the, the GCF uh, is gonna be operating, both in mitigation and adaptation. Um, and what is very important as well, because um, you know in the past there was often a tendency to see um, uh, gender responsiveness and gender integration in, um, in climate projects and pro programs mainly as a thing for adaptation and much less um, relevant for, mit uh, for mitigation. Um, and I think, for example, some of the, the shortcomings still or the lagging behind in the Clean Technology Fund um, in the Climate Investment Fund just shows us that there is a lot more focus on adaptation um, but the understanding and the mandate in the GCF is that actually gender has to be considered for projects in all of those various impact areas. Next slide, please. So the gender advocacy within the GCF, and I think, um, again, this is crucially important uh, from the onset, um, had a dual strategy. So of course, um, there was a persistent lobby to have a GCF gender policy and action plan, which um, uh, despite the mandate in the governing instrument actually came only at the ninth board meeting in March, 2015. Um, it's important to note that that, currently, uh, that that policy is currently under revision. There is a proposed new gender and social inclusion policy uh, that could be adopted at the next board meeting. And we do have some um, concerns about um, that, that relabeling and that refocusing of the policy. I'll go I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I also want to point out that there was a weakness of the original GCF gender policy decision because it allowed kind of in the decision text for a national contextualization meaning that um, there, there was an understanding that gender needed to be integrated, uh, but um, in line with some of the national cultural uh, traditions and approaches, and that of course um, uh, could lead to a significant uh, weakening. And so uh, in the revision of the GCF um, gender policy that uh, is coming up to the board, we wanna make sure that such a national contextualization is avoided and not part um, of a policy or a related policy decision. 
But in addition to focusing on a GCF gender policy and action plan, uh, we right away focused on outreach to board members and the GCF secretariat through a lot of technical submission work, policy analysis, to ensure that simultaneously gender uh, considerations were integrated in key operational policies that were developed for the new green climate fund and they included for example the accreditation requirement um, that means that basically um, the green climate fund um, implements its funding through acting uh, through working through intermediaries that can be public or commercial banks uh, that can be national or international actors, but um, there is an expectation that all of them have sufficient gender capacity and an own gender policy in order to implement the gender mandate of the GCF. Um, it's the integration into results management and performance measurement. Again, very importantly, um, for those of you who might be working on some of the funds, um, it's looking at the portfolio level indicators, both for mitigation and for adaptation and making sure that there is the requirement for, for gender disaggregated um, um, uh, indicators on the portfolio level for mitigation as well. There is the inclusion of um, uh, gender perspective in some of the investment criteria, which are used actually by the board and by a technical advisory panel and the secretariat to assess the quality of the proposals. And um, there is um, uh, the possibility to include um, uh, gender inclusion in country pro uh, project program pipelines and the strengthening of the gender capacity of so-called national um, designated authorities, the interlocutors um, of a country with the Green Climate Fund through readiness uh, and preparatory support financing. Next slide. So um, just going a little bit more into detail what some of that gender uh, integration looks like. So the accreditation requirement, I think, is a very, very interesting one um, because, again, it requires all applicant entities, public and private, um, to show that they have gender competency, that they have a gender track record, or that they have a gender policy and gender action plan, uh, which also means um, the GCF has gone ahead and accredited some of those institutions without um, a dedicated gender policy, own gender, gender policy on, on the book. However, um, such missing gender policies were then um, basically treated as a conditionality, meaning um, the accredited entity, the partner entity of the Green Climate Fund, would have to develop their own gender policy, their own gender capacity and approach before they can receive the first GCF finance disbursement. And I think that has led to some very um, interesting new mandates, for example, particularly for commercial banks like the Deutsche Bank or um, HSBC, big international banks that want to partner with the fund that became accredited, but that actually have to fulfill and now develop, um, and some of them actually for the first time, a gender policy. It is, however, also a challenge for a number of the smaller uh, um, national implementing entities that want to become accredited, but again, a, a good opportunity within those uh, applicant entities to review their own gender capacity and understanding and where it's not sufficient to upgrade it. Um, I already mentioned the results management and performance framework. Again, this is relating mostly um, to the portfolio level indicators. Um, there is unfortunately, as of now, no mandatory um, gender indicators um, at the project level in the policy. Um, however, in practice, um, uh, there has been uh, quite a bit of focus on project level gender disaggregated indicators. One can question whether they always have been the best one, but there is an effort being made. Um, then the investment criteria, I think it's very important um, that there are explicit sub criteria, uh, particularly under um, the core criteria of sustainable development and needs of recipients. Um, um, I think so, and um, the, the, the biggest problem that we have with that is that um, the project proposals are reviewed by a technical panel called the Independent Technical Advisory Panel, um, which is made up of six experts. But while those experts very often um, 
have a specific a sector experience, for example, on water or on agriculture. Um, none of them um, has a dedicated uh, gender and social expertise. So what we've seen in some of those assessments, and they are become uh, publicly available, they are on the GCF website, um, is that they usually just look whether gender more or less was, was mentioned, whether there is a gender assessment and a gender action plan, but they can't really um, look into depth or judge the quality um, of those structural gender components. And this is a weakness that actually has to be improved going forward. Um, readiness and preparatory support I already mentioned. Again, it's crucially important um, that uh, uh, national designated authorities, which have to request readiness and preparatory support, use this as, a, as an opportunity also to strengthen their own gender capacity and to actually bring in women uh, and gender groups as stakeholders into country uh, planning processes, like, for example, for country programs um, that um, uh, countries submit to the GCF and which outline their funding priorities. And right now, um, the process is just starting. We've seen that the first couple of country programs that have come forward uh, really lack that kind of gender acknowledgement. Again, this is something um, where we push from organizations in the recipient countries to have that kind of um, financial opportunity to strengthen gender capacity um, on an institutional level through GCF readiness and preparatory support funding um, uh, really taken advantage of. Lastly, I want to point out um, one, I think, um, pretty interesting example, um, a direct access pilot approach that was or is an ongoing 200 million pilot program for which um, a request for proposals has come out repeatedly um, and where actually um, specific proposals are submitted and as part of the terms of reference for the request of proposals and as part of the scorecard to actually judge concept notes that are coming in under that pilot program um, gender has actually uh, been been uh, integrated into that store, scorecard. And I think that is another example to think outside of basically the, the gender policy or the gender action plan um, in, in terms of gender relevance, but look, for example, as instruments, as targeted requests for proposals. It should be also conceivable in the future or might be a very good thing um, to actually do a targeted request for proposals for some more um, gender focused activities. The next slide. So this just uh, uh, is a really quick overview. I don't want to want to spend uh, much time on that on the requirements for accreditation uh, for accredited entities or entities that want to partner with the Green Climate Fund. And this is for all public and private and irrespective of basically um, whether they just want to implement the money or whether as a financial intermediary they want to grant it on or land it on or use it for equity investment and also independent of um, whether they do small, micro or large projects and whether they do no risk or high risk projects. In all of those cases, and usually for the accreditation, uh, entities have to accredit for a, a specific category. Um, the, the gender policy requirements um, are part and parcel of the, um, basically the edit, accreditation requirements and, and what is uh, then looked at um, before the entity can be accredited. The next slide. This just is basically a, a quick overview over the GCF six high level investment criteria. Again, as I mentioned for gender, uh, most important is the sustainable development criteria because it uh, looks particularly at gender sensitive development impacts and actually expects an elaboration on that. And just to uh, make it a little bit clearer, uh, when a project proponent submits a project proposal to the Green Climate Fund, they actually have to very detailed uh, elaborate how their proposal meets all of those uh, respective six investment criteria. So they have to, to talk about um, how gender sensitive development impact is taken into account. And they also have to talk about how, for example, 
um, uh, women and 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 uh, um, gender groups are taken into account um, uh, in in terms of uh, considering the needs of recipients. Next slide. So really quickly, um, I'm not going to delve too much into it. Um, this is basically a, a, a quick snapshot of um, the, the, the principles that guide the current gender um, policy um, uh, adopted in March of 2015. Again, it's in uh, the process of revision. But it's principles based looking at commitment um, to, to contribute to gender equality, comprehensiveness in scope and coverage, the accountability, country ownership, um, gender competencies, and resource allocation. Um, the, the policy, the current policy does include a reference which we would like to see maintained um, in a revision uh, that if necessary, targeted funding uh, can be provided to women's activities. Um, uh, we actually would like to see that further strengthened um, to also make sure that no funding is going to be um, advanced for proposals that do not take gender sufficiently into account. And again, that is some ongoing um, advocacy work. Um, the GCF Gender Action Plan, again, outlines a couple of priority areas. However, it's very important to note that the um, actual Gender Action Plan is very weak uh, because it did not include a lock frame with dedicated indicators, indicators, a dedicated budget, uh, or a dedicated responsibilities. The board at the time was not willing and able to improve, uh, approve it. And again, that is something that we are hoping for and looking for in the revision of the current gender policy and action plan to have that dedicated block frame with um, an adequate budget and, uh, and very clear responsibility and staff capacities. Next slide. So quickly about the proposed new gender and social inclusion policy, GESI, um, uh, there was an, a call for public uh, input on the review of the gender policy. Um, again, it's been ongoing um, since um, uh, mid-2016, although it has been stalled in terms of board consideration. At the last board meeting, uh, we got a, a, a look at the proposed new policy, which was then relabeled a gender and social inclusion policy um, uh, as uh, um, a submission period for detailed input followed. And I um, integrated here the link, which at the moment is not working, but I'll make sure it, it'll work um, uh, after we are done with um, the, the, the webinar to a submission uh, that's uh, uh, CSOs that are working in the Green Climate Fund and women's groups that are active in the Green Climate Fund jointly submitted. It's very detailed. It also might give you maybe one of the best overview uh, where civil society thinks the area of, of improvement in the gender integration in the Green Climate Fund. So I recommend uh, for you to take a look at it. But um, again, um, uh, what we kind of criticized um, in terms of process is that while they went um, ahead with a new policy, they missed the opportunity to actually do a thorough desk review of gender integration in GCF projects um, that have already been approved in the current proposal. And it's important to note, again, since the GCF is a very a new fund, that very little of them are actually um, in implementation right now, which also means there is still room of improvement. This is something that the gender um, policy review, unfortunately, has not done. Um, Positive, it does articulate a human rights-based approach, something that civil society has, has asked for and proposes a human rights compliance mechanism. It in, uh, mandates the inclusion of gender and social expertise in board committees and related um, panels, including expert panels. And I mentioned, um, uh, for example, um, the uh, lack of, of social and gender expertise that we perceive to be in the independent technical advisory panel, 
whose work um, and uh, actually mandate is also currently under review. Again, that also gives a possibility to, to get some positive changes. Uh, it proposes a detailed new three-year gender action lock frame with indicators, responsibilities, and a budget. Again, a weakness that we didn't have before. And it highlights the need for targeted resource allocation. But it does not provide currently, and again, advocacy on, on getting the best possible new gender policy is ongoing. Um, it does not provide uh, for the possibility of financial set-asides. And again, it does not articulate that projects without sufficient gender integration will not be considered. What are some of the concerns um, that we have? Um, there is uh, some fear that the widening um, of the approach to be basically um, a complete social inclusion might reduce the primary focus on gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, and there is uh, particularly uh, the fear, and that stems from the observation of the last couple of years, that such a widening of, of approach might not be accompanied by more internal staff capacity and dedicated funding. So while, for example, the Secretariat foresees an expansion from the current, I think they are at around um, 120 personnel, almost a doubling by the end of this year to 250, um, the, the staffing plan currently only foresees a total of four people that would do environmental and social safeguards and gender. And again, if you want to really be broadly socially inclusive while still maintaining a focus on gender equality and women's empowerment, you need a lot more staff. Next slide, please. Also, really quickly, um, goal versus reality. You might recall that the governing instrument very clearly points out that there should be a, a gender balance in both the board um, and the secretariat staff. In the board, unfortunately, that has been a very elusive goal of um, 24 board members as of the last uh, board meeting, six were women. That's also uh, just 25% with eight female alternate board members. We don't know yet the full composition um, of the board. Um, uh, with each board meeting, there are changes. However, what we have asked for um, is that actually those countries in the Green Climate Fund developed countries that both um, sent an, a, a main, a principal board member and an alternate board member, um, uh, set a positive example and make sure that one of those two that they are sending to the board is, is a woman. Um, this um, is Germany, uh, France, the UK, Japan, and the United States. And so far, um, um, I think just one or two of them have, have uh, even taken that into consideration. Also, the gender balance um, of this uh, GCF secretariat staff uh, looks, has definitely improved. However, um, it, it has to be noted that there is an imbalance between what is called the international professional staff, that's the high level policy setting implementation staff, and the support level, administrative level staff. And you can see from that numbers that not very surprisingly, women are overly represented in the administrative and support staff. So the goal, goal there, again, would be to ensure that uh, a lot of the new hiree for, for policy positions um, are actually women. And again, geographical distribution and uh, the variety of backgrounds is really important there as well. Next slide. So what are some of the key opportunities and challenges for improvement? Um, this is um, kind of an ongoing list. They're probably not a complete list, but just some of the things um, that, that came to mind when I was thinking um, about it this morning. So um, there is a strategic plan that kind of lays out the midterm vision of the Green Climate Fund. It does mention gender sensitivity, but insufficiently. So it's very important as the board does a regular kind of review of where they are with the implication of the strategic plan to keep on pushing and asking for um, how gender is taken into account. Um, I think one of the examples uh, where we also could do better um, is integration um, of gender considerations into the private sector approach. Um, this is also a pilot program, a 200 million pilot program. However, um, uh, we did have some success 
in actually turning was what, what was originally conceived as a small and medium uh, uh, sized enterprise approach into a micro small and medium enterprise approach and that second m is really really important or that initial m uh, if you know that a lot of the uh, women owned um, enterprises um, or businesses um, and particularly also a lot of them in the informal sector are disproportionately um, held um, are disproportionately in the micro and small category so actually for um, such an approach uh, to, to have an impact and, and to help support women entrepreneurs, um, uh, a focus on micro and small enterprises is really crucial. Um, and also, obviously, in terms of how um, those uh, projects that are approved um, under that pilot approach are constructed, for example, the importance that if the GCF provides subsidies and financial support, that must be passed on to women uh, entrepreneurs as basically the final recipients, for example, in form of easily accessible uh, green credit lines um, for highly concessional patient small um, scale loans, because that is what women entrepreneurs in the micro um, and small enterprise sectors really need the most. So we need uh, also further strengthening of the fund level stakeholder participation mechanism. There is a very strong mandate in the governing instrument, but even um, after 18 board meetings, there is not a, not, not a clear um, fund specific guideline for stakeholder participation. And there is a concrete upcoming opportunity um, also to improve um, observer participation in the board. Um, also, the guidelines for stakeholder participation for national designated authorities in the name of country ownership are relatively weak. However, um, uh, the secretariat could do more with some um, soft um, pushing to, to ensure that NDAs do a better job of integrating uh, women um, and gender machineries and uh, institutions better in, into the processes. There is an opening, but very um, underdeveloped and not clearly defined of a participatory monitoring approach in the monitoring and accountability framework of the Green Climate Fund. Again, I think there are opportunities, including uh, for the uh, participation of women and gender um, uh, groups uh, and local communities to help in setting appropriate uh, project indicators. And that is also something where we need continued advocacy push. Um, improvements are needed in the project uh, proposal process. Um, I'll go into that uh, a little bit more detail into the next slide. I already mentioned that it's really, really crucial that we get more gender expertise in key GCF panels and groups. That includes the technical advisory panel that I have already mentioned, but also very critically important, the accreditation panel, which actually assesses whether an entity um, has the capacity um, and the ability and willingness to move forward to implement a gender mandate um, that the GCF sets. Um, and again, um, like in the um, independent technical advisory panel, there is no gender expertise, at least from what we can tell, uh, currently represented in, in the accreditation panel. So it's more of a check that the policies exist or that the policies might be designed, but not necessarily um, that they are good policies and, and that they are seriously implemented. And the last one, a very important one, is the private sector advisory group. There again, it's important that, for example, private sector brings in women's entrepreneurs um, perspective. And um, uh, fortunately, the private sector advisory group um, and the outside advisors have taken on um, kind of a, a, gen, a stronger gender mandate at one of their last meetings. So we'll hope to see some improvements there. There is the potential for establishing a gender advisory group in the GCF secretariat. This is something that is left open um, as an option under the new gender and so, uh, so uh, under the new gender uh, policy proposal. Uh, we have to see whether that uh, moves forward. And then I think really, really important is also the ongoing work of the various accountability mechanisms that are set up. It was very good that actually in 
in the job search, uh, in the search for uh, the heads of the various accountability units, they put um, uh, human rights um, uh, experience and, and gender expertise as one of the selection criteria, And that is obviously crucial for the independent readers mechanism, which is going to hear from project affected people, but also for the independent evaluation unit, which can, for example, um, uh, push both the board and the secretariat for improvements through independent evaluation. And we have seen how that actually led, for example, in the CIFs and in the GEFs, really to improvements in the way gender is integrated. Um, lastly, I think there is um, a lot of room to, to think about it how uh, women's and gender uh, groups, how women's fund, uh, whether and how they can uh, become either directly accredited uh, to the Green Climate Fund, and I noticed one of the future webinars is looking a little bit more at that, but also play a role as so-called executing entities as a partner in implementation, um, working with an implementing entity that would uh, submit the proposal uh, for for specific element um, of, of projects or programs. Next slide. So I wanted to take uh, quickly a, sh a look at the integration of gender and GCF projects and programs. What works, what is missing. As indicated, uh, so far we have 54 approved projects and programs worth 2.6 billion that have been considered and approved since November 2015. Um, a pro project or program specific gender and social impact analysis is mandatory for all proposals, so irrespective of mitigation, adaptation, private sector or public sector. But so far, a project or program uh, gender action plans, specific gender action plans are not. And that is obviously a to-do item to make sure um, that that is very explicitly asked for in the gender policy. Interestingly, the project and program gender assessments and actions plans um, were only published um, since the 15th board meeting. Um, those were, or those are actually annexes to the project uh, funding proposals and civil society and the public at large doesn't see a lot of those um, annexes. So uh, civil society pushed successfully to have them uh, published. However, that also means um, that um, uh, for all of the project proposals approved before B15, we do have no documentation of existing gender assessment and gender action plans. And actually some of us uh, very much speculated that that's largely because a number of those projects did not have them, which is also why the accountability of publishing those um, gender assessment and action plans, making them publicly available on the GCF website is so important. The board so far has only imposed in one instance, and that was um, a, a project by the Agence France, uh, um, Agence France de Développement in Morocco, um, and actually condition on the improving by asking that the um, the AFD, sorry, that's, that's a typo there, that the AFD goes back and actually uh, redoes um, their, their uh, gender and social assessment and comes up with a, uh, uh, with a good um, gender action plan. Um, so um, this uh, has been an, a, a problem because a lot of the um, analysis and gender action plans that have come forward would have needed improvements and we would have liked to see a similar conditionality um, uh, uh, applied to a number of those projects. Um, so um, what are some of the problems that we see with the published gender assessments and action plans? Um, uh, again, a number of them have significant shortcomings, but hopefully you know, we can, can move forward and improve that. Very often the gender action plan is only a list of activities, but does not show clear indicators, responsibilities, or does assign budgets. Um, often both the assessment and the elaboration of the action plans are uh, outsourced to consultant, which is a problem because that fulfills obviously the document requirement, but it does not necessarily lead then to having the necessary gender expert or gender expertise in the project program implementation unit by the implementing entity. And again, while um, a continued um, uh, use of consultant 
might fulfill the procedural requirement, I think it misses a very important internal learning opportunity for the implementing entities. And we have to keep in mind that the ones that usually come to the board or the, the, the personnel that usually comes to the board are actually uh, the, the energy or, or sector uh, units of, of uh, for example, multilateral development banks um, that are accredited entities. So bringing actually in-house gender experts and social expertise into the program implementation unit as core staff is really important. And then lastly, very often it's treated as an add-on a set of activities, but it's not sufficiently integrated into the overall project um, rationale, um, the project proposal, and very often not included in the overall budget and indicator lock frame. Um, next slide. And I think I'm almost done. Um, again, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going into that in more detail. Again, just to mention the example of the one um, IFD project um, in Morocco, uh, where the GCF, and again, that was so far the only time the GCF board approved the project, but as a condition for finance disbursement, asked um, that IFD uh, provides an elaborated gender action plan that should address um, a, a couple of issues. Um, uh, articulated here. And what that shows, and in my opinion, is the need that we have a very clear policy and communication to accredited entities and NDAs that project and program proposals without sufficiently articulated and integrated gender dimensions will not be considered by the board. And just to point out that the gender policy as the adaptation fund has such a provision, and we would like to see that in the revised gender policy or gender and social inclusion policy for the GCF. Next slide, and I think that's my last, if I remember correctly. No. Um, sorry, I, I know I'm running out of time, but um, this one is important. Um, so what are some of the women and gender advocacy priority actions? On the fund level, um, I think it's the continued technical input and gender analysis of seemingly unrelated policies. What do I mean by that? For example, I think it's very much a matter of gender responsiveness um, of whether um, uh, grant financing is um, protected, uh, including full cost grant financing. Um, certain projects can only be done on a grant basis, um, not on a loan basis. And if you have pushes in the GCF, um, as we see it by the Secretariat, to actually reduce the CAN component, uh, discourage um, accredited entities, um, including national implementing entities, from actually requesting a lot of um, grant uh, financing resources, then that is can be very de detrimental to a gender responsive implementation. Um, and again, full cost grant financing and not just an additional uh, finance cost approach is very important. We also would need to push back um, against um, the artificial dividing line between development um, and adaptation. And that goes back to some very concrete experiences that we had in the GCF where some proposals were rejected because they supposedly were too much development and too little adaptation and coincidentally or maybe not coincidentally both of them had a very strong gender focus inclusion with a, a social financing provision also we need to focus on improvements to the project approval process um, uh, there is a mandate now to make it a two-stage process, which I think provides some opportunity. So that means rather than just allow for the full project proposal um, to be submitted, a concept stage would be mandatory. That would also mean that concept note would be made public and that would allow for early information on early input opportunity um, and bring a little bit more transparency into what is currently a very intransparent project pipeline in the GCF where project information comes way too late. Um, there are a couple of core policies uh, for consideration at the next board meeting. Um, that all have very uh, relevant um, uh, gender dimensions, the environmental and social policy, the indigenous people's policy, and the review of the observer participation. 
And then on the recipient country level, and I want to end with that, um, I think it's fundamentally important that women and gender groups must make their interest in the GCF known and their presence as core stakeholders within the country to the NDAs, the national designated authorities, the um, direct access entities, either national or regional, that might be um, uh, being active in their countries and the accredited international entities that are operating there, for example, by offering their capacity as executing entity and again in, uh, in working and engaging with the NDAs, making sure that GCF country programs that are submitted by the NDAs include gender considerations. And lastly, as more and more projects are now under implementation, it's very important that women and, and gender groups um, have a role and can play a role in some of the critical um, um, on the ground monitoring report feedback on what wor works and what does not work so that that uh, then can be taken into account, for example, in, in policy formulation, in revisions and, and, and pressuring both the board and the secretariat. So thank you very much. The last slide is just resources. I think I was a couple of minutes over. Thank you for your patience. And I'm looking forward to a lot of questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Liana. Um, and I'm just going to now pull out the um, questions bar. I know there was a couple that came in. And I also know that among the attendees, um, I see a few hands that have been raised. Um, so. I'm going to just, as a starting point, read out some of the questions that have come in. Um, and uh, one of them is a question for from the earlier slides related to um, the GCF monitors and whether or not there's someone who covers the Pacific region. Uh, and so I know that Masan is on here now, so I might uh, leave a few minutes at the end to come back to the GCF monitors uh, and then answer that question as well. Um, there's a, uh, a, a comment or sorry, a question from Shayla Shahid from uh, Bangladesh. Um, participatory monitoring approach is um, oh, uh, is a let me just you know what I'm just gonna unmute you. Um, Shayla, let me find you. Perfect. Shayla, why don't you put your question forward? Shayla, are you there? Yes. Hi, Brigitte. Hi, Hi, how are yeah. you? Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, how are you all? Very good. <laughs> uh, it was really very much interesting to listen to all of you. And uh, definitely, it's a very good initiative and to, to learn about this uh, gender and climate finance and all these uh, critical factors. Uh, so um, my particular question is because Liane came up with uh, certain specific recommendations and she also mentioned about this participatory monitoring approach. Uh, uh, so it is very much appreciable and we have also seen three women leaders as GSF uh, monitors. But uh, my question is, however, till date, is there any monitoring or assessment report available? Um, uh, especially um, on gender and climate finance context, uh, on the performance of uh, gender action plan or the gender strategies, uh, those are available under this uh, specific fund. And, uh, and how this participatory monitoring approach can be taken forward, especially at the national level? Excellent. So I think that's a good question. Two parts, really. What kind of resources exist that have reflected on what kind of monitoring is being done on these projects. I think it's a little bit newer with the GCF, but there's certainly some in the other funds. And then I think leading into the question of how do we build on this participatory monitoring approach. Um, the next question, there is one from Lindsay McCormick, who asked, um, Lindsay, if you're still there, because um, I think it's nice to hear from other people on the call. Uh, let's see, do I see you? Yes, I'm going to unmute you, Lindsay, so you can ask your question. Okay, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for these presentations. I'm, I'm new to the Green Climate Fund. This was really helpful. Um, my, my question was, I, I work with the International Planned Parenthood Federation, um, and our local member associations are primarily sexual and reproductive health organizations, um, but with connections to 
you know, millions of women. Um, my question is, does that kind of work, um, can that be contemplated within a broader um, climate change mitigation adaptation uh, project? Um, how would you suggest, if, if it is possible, how do they connect with their local um, designated authorities? <clears throat> That's, if Excellent. that's the right Thanks. phrase. Yep. Accredited entities. Perfect. So I'm going to take a few more questions. So I see another question kind of is in from TT. Um, so TT, I'm going scrolling down. I'm going to unmute you for you can ask your own question. TT, are you there? I can't hear you, TT. So I'm going to mute you again and just quickly ask your question, which was. Um, around the gender markers with the, which the Jeff uses, um, is it possible that the GCF could also adopt similar gender markers? Uh, then we also have a question from Gertrude. And let's see if I can scroll to you quickly. I have to remember my alphabet. Um, here we go, Gertrude, you are unmuted. Yeah, are you able so to? Yeah, there yes. you go. <laughs> yes, thanks a lot. My question is, um, I'm also a bit new to the Green Climate Fund, and therefore I would like to know, that does the Green Climate Fund has a complaint mechanism? Mm -hmm. And how is it structured? How does it work? And if it's, if it's there, are complaints on disregard, on gender relevance, or, or on maybe women's rights violations even, um, are they eligible to the complaint mechanism? Great. Maybe, maybe we should... Um, just just try on focusing on answering some of those before we we go to to the next pack. Or were there any more, Bridget? How did There's you a few more, to... but it's up to you. If you'd like to, if you'd like to start answering, that's fine. Maybe we'll start answering because I'm okay. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I got all of them, um, and I want to make sure that we are not losing detail of of some of the questions um, in in uh, in 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 basically an attempt to answer yes, it. Go ahead. So um, maybe maybe uh, going ahead with Sheila's question and 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 thanks for that. So um, I think um, obviously within the Green Climate Fund there has not been an assessment uh, yet made. Um, the Green Climate Fund is a relatively new, but you have seen quite a number of assess assessments uh, in other funds. Um, in some cases that led. Um, to the introduction of, of, of a gender policy, like for example, in, in the case of the Adaptation Fund, which came relatively late to having a gender policy just in, in last year. Um, in other cases, like in the CIFs, you know, the, the uh, review process actually helped in upgrading and in improving some of the policies. Uh, and again, in the case, for example, of the GEF, it was an independent review by an independent evaluation part. Um, of, 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 of the Jeff. So again, that independent outside look and evaluation is very useful. Um, again, in the GCF, um, there has not been um, a, a review. And as I indicated, um, I think an opportunity to have a more specific uh, review of how um, gender was integrated into project proposals um, so far was missed in, in the ongoing uh, policy review part. On the participatory monitoring, I think um, there is a lot of um, experience, particularly in development finance with participatory monitoring. There is some reference to it in the um, GCF um, governing instrument, which we have used in advocacy then to push uh, for inclusion in the monitoring and accountability framework. Right now though, and that's why I said it's very um, insufficiently reflected, the way that the GCF Secretariat under the Monitoring and Accountability Framework basically um, interprets um, a, a participatory monitoring approach is actually by the NDA, the National Designated um, Authority, conducting once a year um, kind of a um, coming together of GCF related in uh, stakeholders within the countries and, and you know, talking and providing a feedback. This is very different from how we would like to see participatory monitoring um, uh, integrated, namely as something that, for example, should come into the consideration of how project proposals are developed and submitted, um, for example, with um, consideration 
um, of project specific um, um, monitoring indicators, um, meaning that, for example, communities would have a say or would have the opportunity to indicate what would be indicators that for them significant uh, signify, signify that the project has been um, a success. And those might be very different than the ones that the accredited entity sets. Um, and, 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 and again, um, that understanding or that broader understanding of participatory monitoring in the GCF con uh, context is something where we have to do a continued uh, policy and advocacy push. So that's on that. On, on Lindsay's question and her work with um, uh, health organizations that work on sexual and reproductive uh, rights. Um, it is not directly applicable to the work that the GCF does, but indirectly in the sense, um, if you recall back um, on, on one of the earlier uh, slides when I was showing the so-called impact areas for, for GCF uh, projects, that in terms of addressing vulnerabilities, um, um, uh, in increasing the resilience of populations, um, a, a number of those health and sexual and reproductive rights um, components can be taken into account. I have yet to see, though, a project proposal where um, that was um, given a stronger consideration. And again, that has probably to do with what I mentioned uh, beforehand that those proposals are usually elaborated by either the finance specialists or the uh, energy specialists or the water specialists and accredited entities and a related team very rarely include, you know, broader uh, gender and social expertise. So it hasn't come to the fore yet. Doesn't mean that there isn't an opportunity for that to come um, uh, to be con more future, more comprehensive. Um, adaptation uh, projects uh, particularly. I would point out though, this is exactly what I was saying on why it is so important to push for a very broad and comprehensive understanding of adaptation and, and push back on against some uh, um, of the attempts, particularly by developed um, uh, country GCF board members to say this does nothing has nothing to do anymore with adaptation. It's clearly a development project and thus not eligible under funding. And again, um, I think it's an ongoing discourse. The GCF is currently looking at um, defining its adaptation approach because it's a lot easier to define mitigation than than adaptation, and it's an ongoing policy discourse. On Titi's question on whether the GCF could uh, have similar gender markers to the GEF, it's very interesting that actually the existing gender policy did have some similar um, gender markers, meaning gender portfolio indicators for quality um, at entry in particular, um, but nobody actually looked at it or enforced it or reported on it. So obviously a set of uh, such uh, similar gender markers uh, could be very useful um, for the GCF going, going forward. And again, that's something that um, needs to be integrated into um, the, the draft policy. Um, um, I'm not recalling at the moment whether um, such indicators uh, were, were proposed. Um, I think this is something where one would have to, to again, um, look specifically uh, for additional suggestions to improve the policy. And then um, on good, Gertrude's question on the complaint mechanism. Yes, indeed, the GCF does have a complaint mechanism. It has a, a so-called independent redress mechanism that is uh, capable and able to hear complaints um, from project affected people. Um, the way it's going to work is is very, very tricky. Um, and again, um, uh, that's something where continued advocacy from our side is on as, as the mandate um, for the independent redress mechanism in the GCF is still under development. We had basically a revised terms of reference for their work. Now they are looking at guidelines for implementation. This is work um, that is delayed. Um, uh, but um, again, a very crucial one. What we are very concerned about 
is that there might be a presumption that you basically have to go through uh, the redress or complaints or grievance mechanism of the accredited entities first, kind of work their way through that. Some of them might be set up as project specific uh, uh, grievance procedures, and that can be in some case, uh, some case as insufficient as just providing a, a telephone number so that you can phone in complaints and then it's not quite clear what's, what's uh, happening then. Um, what we are asking for is actually to ensure that at any time, irrespective of whether, for example, the World Bank, um, which is an implementer under the Green Climate Fund and has its own inspection panel and with that kind of an own grievance, grievance mechanism, independent of that, the GCF I, uh, um, independent redress mechanism should be accessible at all times if um, uh, communities and, and people uh, that feel that they are directly affected um, basically want to bring it to their attention, might not feel, for example, comfortable with the grievance uh, mechanism set up uh, by a private sector um, entity that works with the GCF. And that should obviously include um, the ability and the easy accessibility for complaints that come up um, from, from women in, in, in communities, indigenous women, women in communities. The question of the evaluation um, and so, so to, uh, to say there's absolutely uh, right, uh, grounds uh, for bringing such uh, complaints forward when, when women's rights and women's participation, for example, um, is, is violated or not taken into account. Um, at least from, from how, how we estimate it, it's obviously not put to the test yet. Um, but for the larger question of how well gender is doing in the GCF, that would be a role for the independent evaluation unit. And we would hope to see that they are actually using us as, as an opportunity to also push the boundaries a little bit. Okay, thank you so much, Liana. So I'm going to go back to, there were a few people who wanted to make some comments, and then there's some broader questions still. Um, and I think we also want to come back to the GCF monitor piece. So my suggestion is that in the next 12 minutes that we have, I'm going to open the floor back up to um, Ruth, who um, has experience with implementing, I know, with the, the Jeff um, on the ground. And so she's going to give some comments. Uh, and then um, we'll go back to the other questions. And if people would like to stay for an extra 10 minutes, we can spend that 10 minutes talking about the GCF monitor process. Uh, so Ruth, I've just unmuted you if you'd like to comment and share what you've already put forward in the questions. Ruth, can you hear us? Uh, Ruth, I think, okay, we might have, Ruth might not be on anymore. Let me just try one more time. Um, oh, Ruth, are you there? Uh, sorry, Ruth, we can't hear you. Um, so I've left you unmuted. If you do come on and you'd like to share, um, please feel free to. Uh, we had other questions, which I'm going to try to quickly um, summarize. We had one around um, giving advice to project proposals, something which the Jeff does. Is this something that the GCF does um, and uh, do they cover Central Asia region? Um, and I guess this is a question and maybe sharing about one of the new resources that the, the GCF has put out um, to try to help and support with project proposals. Um, the rest of the questions are around, a number of the questions are around CSO mechanisms. And so I think we can talk about this in the, G, uh, in the GCF monitor discussion. Um, Similar, similarly with Shraddha's question about uh, an expertise subgroup. Um, there is a question about how community people engage in climate funds. So maybe, I don't know, Leanne, if you had one or two words on, on the potential for the enhancing um, access to specific groups. Um, and then one of the other, there's two other questions which are, which you probably can read yourself, um, but one of them is around if you had the chance to integrate gender considerations into a new climate fund, for example, a national fund, that go beyond what the GCF is doing now, example, only collecting sex disaggregated data but not looking at transformative potential, what would it be? Um, 
And then Laura's question um, to you, Leanne, is does the new simplified approvals process represent a move to uh, for more inclusive action of women's organizations working locally? Um, is it is it a step up, and is this an opportunity for women's organizations? So I think these are kind of the last process questions that we have. And if you could just be as concise as possible, then we'll stay on and just get any last questions about what we can do together on the call. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try. On, on the first one, giving advice to project proposals, I'm not quite sure I understand. Um, I, I, I think uh, it refers to whether the, the GCF is actually giving advice on project proposals or is working um, with, with the accredited entities. Um, they they do they they actively there is an active back and forth. My understanding is that they particularly uh, work with the uh, um, national implementing entities, just because a lot of them have a hell of a challenge um, to work with the Green Climate Fund. So there is a lot more interaction there. Uh, that being said, I think there can be or there should be probably more um, capacity building support to, for example, through readiness um, and preparatory support financing to actually um, help with project um, development um, and inclusive project development. And that's something where there's room for improvement. I skipped the one on the CSO mechanisms. Um, I'm not quite sure what, what the question was on, on the expert subgroup. Um, maybe uh, if you can rephrase the question. Um, I think we can talk about that. I think we can talk about in the GCF monitor piece as well. Um, so how can communities engage uh, with the Green Climate Fund? Um, it's at the moment very hard to do it um, directly. Uh, lots of uh, community groups don't have uh, sufficient expertise, why I think the role of um, you know, multipliers, like for example the monitors, is really, really crucially important. And obviously making more information um, available um, on the ground. However, um, I mean, one of the forms of engagement actually should be when some of the uh, project proposals are developed because they all require very early consultation and outreach processes, which is why when we, for example, try um, to assess some of the proposals that come to the board, we always try to reach out to civil society and colleagues that can act at, at those multipliers to community in the countries where the proposals are supposed to be implemented to ask actually whether that kind of outreach and engagement has happened. On the national fund, um, uh, what more can, can, can be done? Um, um, actually, uh, some of the, the core uh, issues are a very strong representation um, of uh, gender on, on um, decision-making boards within such a fund. Obviously, uh, a priority to including gender and social expertise um, into a, a secretariat um, or, or a staff. Uh, definitely uh, either a financial set aside or making clear that uh, proposals are to be considered prime, um, um, as an added bonus, might be preferential, getting preferential treatment. If they do an extremely good job with gender, show, show approaches outside of the block. On transformational, it's really um, making sure that you do not accept business as usual projects or, or add-ons. Um, where, where gender, for example, is only considered as an add-on, which might also, for example, um, require the very clear elaboration of um, an inclusion list of, of project approaches, uh, technologies, um, or, or other areas. And then on the process of the simplified, um, uh, the simplified um, access uh, process, um, does that make for more inclusive action? Um, I'm, it could potentially, however, the pilot is very small and um, the simplification doesn't look that simple at all at the moment. So there is still quite a bit of, of paper and submission requirement. Um, so um, it's actually too early to tell whether that can be a, a game changer. I think showing that that is something that needs to be a more prioritized. Simplifying access is, is certainly a good first step 
uh, but again, um, discouragingly, the, the 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 pilot is is very small, and at least from the documentation that we have seen, the simplification is really not that significant yet. Excellent. So, I think building from this and and what we've seen and in, in what are one of the recommendations that Liana put forward was in the the monitoring that needs to happen on multiple levels. And a lot of the questions here were about what CSO mechanisms exist. Um, and last time on our first webinar, um, Dan and uh, Chichi uh, from Indonesia talked, gave perspectives on what, what it looks like to follow and uh, the GCF from both at a global level as well as at a national level. And I know that many of you probably have different experiences of, of doing this with different funds. Um, and so in a very small pilot way, um, as part of this project, in addition to doing these knowledge-based webinars, we uh, tried to produce some travel funds to be able to support uh, women to actually attend the GCF board meetings. But the travel, of course, is just one is one aspect of it. The intention is to be able to really build up a, a feedback mechanism. So I'm going to um, unmute Masan because you both had questions and comments, and I believe you're hopefully still on now. Masan, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Yes, great. So do you want to just quickly introduce yourself and then speak to some of the comments or questions that you had put forward? Oh, OK. So um, my name is Masan Dalmeda. I'm based in Lome, uh, in Togo. That's in West Africa. And um, uh, the founding president of Kwaise is a new francophone women's fund that we've been putting in place since uh, uh, 2015. Uh, we are almost done, and we should start working, I, I hope, uh, from this year on. Uh, so one of the six priority areas of uh, the fund um, is on gender environment, uh, gender environment and climate change. So, is uh, my uh, participation in this uh, monitors project will help us develop our own activities around that team, and also supporting women's organizations and uh, encouraging their engagement in uh, both the GCF but also in other environmental issues processes. Um, I have one comment, uh, question. Um, I think my question was around uh, whether there are specific CSO mechanisms that are in place to follow up with uh, project implementation. Because um, I think the current engagement of CSOs is at the global level to look into the project. Um, it may also be at national level, it depends. Uh, but it's mainly focusing on looking uh, into the project development and making sure that uh, they are integrating the gender dimension and also focusing on women uh, as partners. But sometimes there, are, uh, there may be a huge gap between what is written in a document that may be uh, perfect and what is really happening on the ground. Um, so if we, if there is a mechanism in place, and if there is not, how could we think about one? Uh, from the presentation, I already got some answers, but yet I'm putting it forward because I think that it's really important because sometimes you may have a very good project document and if it's uh, solely on their own, they may also be able to come up with a very good report that align with the project document but on the ground is completely another reality. So um, whether there's something happening around it already, or uh, whether it's something that we should be working on seriously. But I guess that at national levels, uh, there are not enough um, engagement with uh, the NDAs. So my question around it is, um, is there a set, um, let's say, a uh, guideline around what these um, uh, mechanisms should look like, whether there is a room for CSO's participation or it's only when convening meetings to have them around. If it's just that, it's not enough in my sense. 
So just to understand how it's working and see how we could be pushing for it further. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that um, that's a good question to come back to because a lot of people I think have that question is, is, is there anything or requirement or mechanism that does exist for engagement with NDAs at national level or is a lot of this work that needs to be created and done? And just to to add on to um, Masan, so Maria Julia, who is unable to, because she has a bad connection, so she can't introduce herself, and Wanun um, from Thailand will be, the three of them, um, alongside myself and I know Liana and also Dan from both ends, who's on this call as well, will all be attending the upcoming GCF board meeting. I think in between that time, um, each of the the monitors are going to be hosting uh, calls with other interested activists in the region because we're all at a very similar fa stage in terms of um, in, in uh, participating in the GCF and trying to think about what kind of mechanisms, particularly civil society input and monitoring mechanisms should and could exist. So I think this speaks to some of what Shima's question, but also Strata, where she suggested I think a subgroup of um, either the women's major group or the women and gender constituency uh, that is looking again at how do we monitor these projects. I think that for those of us engaging in constituencies at a global level, we always have some people who are thinking about the issue of climate finance, but we don't really have that structure for the feedback mechanisms that are being driven by local and national level organizations. So. I think there's a hope that this is um, this is a pilot and a start of being able to create that kind of platform. I'm going to pass back to um, Leanna in case she wants to add any closing thoughts about the the CSO engagement at national level. Well, just just really pointing out um, that it's important to engage, and that can be as simple as trying to find out who the national designated authority in your respective countries is. And then, you know, give them a call, shoot them an email and say, you know, we we are stakeholders uh, in in uh, the country. We are trying to find out what um, the plans for my country's engagement with the Green Climate Funds are. You as the NDA are supposed to reach out to stakeholder coordination. Are there any uh, activities that you are planning? Sometimes it's already enough just to put them on notice that somebody is there is asking them. Again, I'm, I'm not naive. I know that in different countries that poses different challenges. Uh, but again, uh, it, 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 it's also very useful to find out, for example, whether in your country um, there are civil society um, um, organizations that are already accredited as observers with the Green Climate Fund. Uh, so you can become an accredited um, CSO observer organization, um, which means, you know, information is shared. And then if you have the opportunity to participate in meetings, um, it, it, it allows you then for registration. And some of that information, including what the engagement of your respective country with the Green Climate Fund is, is part um, um, of the GCF dossier that we've put up on our website, on the Heinrich Böll Foundation North America website. Um, the link is provided. We call that uh, GCF country info. And what it is actually is that we've gone um, through the documents of the GCF, through some of the information they have on their website, but often not very easily accessible, and try to pull together a database that when you basically click your on your country from a pull-down menu, shows you what kind of um, the current engagements um, of your country are. Meaning, uh, does my country have a national um, uh, um, a national um, uh, implementing entity accredited, who are civil society organizations accredited, um, who's the NDA um, for, for my country, does my country have a readiness and preparatory support program um, ongoing with the GCF, are there already some projects um, that are uh, approved with the GCF. So that gives you a good starting point and again um, outreach to the NDA, making your presence and your interests known, I think is a, is a core step then to be able to become more engaged and also to, uh, to raise um, the, the likelihood that some of your concerns will be heard um, and considered. And obviously that is also the first step then um, 
um, to, uh, to engaging with the uh, larger CSO community that is monitoring and following the Green Climate Fund. So there is a CSO listserv. If um, you are not afraid um, of the mass um, of, of uh, uh, you know, information that is provided via that, um, you can um, get in touch with me to be added to the listserv. It's very simple. Titi and other colleagues are already on there. You can obviously disregard what comes over it, but it allows you um, um, to share what some of the discourses are. And, and what some of the opportunities are for CSOs to be engaged in the, in the Green Climate Fund. Thank you, Leanna. And we'll be sure that those links will be clear um, and provided to you, including where you can get that information about the NDAs, as, as Leanna talked about, um, and potentially signing up to the listserv. Um, I'm just going to try one last time with Ruth, because she mentioned that she was there. Ruth, are you? You've just muted yourself. You just need to click the mic again, Ruth. Ruth, are you there? I think your mic is on, but we can't hear you, unfortunately. OK. So hopefully we can share um, we can share more experiences. Please feel free to email us and be in contact with anything and any issues that you had or any follow-up questions that you might want to share. Um, we would be happy to. Uh, forward them or try to get answers to you online and over email if unfortunately we haven't been able to address your question here. And again, anything that we discuss, feel free to reach out to myself, my colleagues from both ends, Cindy and Dan, who are both um, on this call as well. Um, and we can also, you know, be in touch with Leanna for any follow up on this. Thank you so much for all of your attention. I think it was a really excellent discussion and Consistently, there's just more and more questions uh, and more and more, more and more depth to cover on these issues, which is why we are hoping to continue to have these discussions and follow-up series, um, but are available at different times to, to really think this through uh, and to try to make sure that all of this money that is supposed to be creating a paradigm shift towards a more sustainable planet actually does and is gender just as it does so. So thank you so much. Thank you very much to Liana for her expertise and time. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.